Hey everyone, welcome uh, to The Agronomists. It looks like there is a lovely delay in my sound, but you know what, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna roll with it because one of our guests isn't even here yet tonight. So why not also have my audio be messed up? All right, um, oh, you're welcome, Ken. Ken says, thanks for cutting down the intro music levels. You're absolutely welcome. I do it manually, but you know. Um, and welcome here, Ray, and big hello to Warren Schneckenberger. I wanted to throw out there, before we get started tonight, Warren has figured out how this works. And that is when we announce what the topic is going to be and who the guests are, Warren sends the guests a note about the questions he has and says, can we talk about this? And then they send me the note that says, hey, Lindsay, we're going to talk about this. And I say, okay, then. Um, oh, hey, we've got some watchers from Brazil. Hello. Hello, Jason. Um, hope Manitoba is treating you uh, just fine right now. Okay, so uh, before we get started, of course, a reminder, CU credits are available for this uh, broadcast. So head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. This post will be ready um, and you can fill out your info and claim your credits there. Um, I am also glad to be back after being off last week. Um, quick note though, next week we are actually because because it is election night, we're going to host uh, Real Ag Politics, our new live broadcast. Uh, we'll be hosting a special election night um, version next Monday. So there will not be an agronomy topic. It will be an election, which maybe that will be more interesting, but I highly doubt it because I much prefer agronomy. Okay, that's why I host this show and not any others. So I'm not sure if Wheat Pete is here yet. He's been having a, a few issues with trying to connect. Uh, but we do have uh, Dr. Dave Hooker, who is here with me tonight. So we're going to start off this broadcast. And if Pete can join us, Pete joins us. So welcome here, Dave. Hi, thanks. Good good to see you. Yeah. yeah, I have to say that. Yeah, you do. We, 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 Pete always has some issues, you know. <laughs> just, just kidding. They're not always... They're no. not always technology I, issues. No, exactly. Yes, yes, um, and yeah. yeah, shout out to Farmer Jim in the Combine out in uh, Lance or Saskatchewan um, or there and abouts. I hope that um, the Combine is actually full. I'm going to guess it's not, but okay. All right. So now we, we are going to wait for Wheat Pete. He is trying to connect. Um, he, he did send me a laundry list of things he wants to talk about. Um, but uh, because he's not here, Dave, we get to talk about what you want to talk about. And right. now you probably, yeah, you probably both agree on, you know, adding wheat into the rotation, but I do want to just to, just to catch everybody up to speed, tell me about the work you do with the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus um, and the long-term research trials that you're working on there. Yeah. Um, well, just basically my, my position is uh, I'm an associate professor in uh, cropping systems and uh, it's one of the most favorite topics is uh, is cropping systems and looking at the big picture. I like the systems approach. And of course, and as agronomist, like there are just so many different components of agronomy. And I just love that because that's that's the way that farming is. And so I, I still farm um, at part slash full time farming, and also doing the job at Ridgetown. And it's, uh, it's uh, one of my greatest, I think it's the greatest job in the world. Gets the best of both worlds, I think. So yeah, this, absolutely. um, yeah. So my research at Ridgetown, a lot of I have a few long-term research trials at Ridgetown, and um, I've just been privileged to be plugged in to these long-term trials, and also all, all of them are highly like a highly collaborative effort uh, across a number of different dif disciplines because all of these are are agronomic trials. Hey, there's Peter. There's Pete. Welcome here. I mean, you're sort of you're sort of stealing Dave Thunder, but you know that's okay. Oh, he's still. I hate to say it, Pete, but you're a little slow. <laughs> he might catch up. We'll see. All yeah, right. Well, all right. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. Okay. So carrying on because this is it is pretty fantastic yeah. stuff you get to work on. So these uh, these long term trials. My favorite one is a long term crop rotation trial, and and if anybody knows me at all, they know that's my favorite experiment to talk about, just because it's had so much such a great impact um, to the farm community, just in terms of like my farm as well, but also um, like 
producers deciding which crop rotation is the best, how to adjust nitrogen rates, uh, whether to include underseeded red clover or not. Those are all very uh, important questions, and these long-term trials help to answer some of those um, really pressing questions that producers need to make as soon as possible if they are like if they do have long-term results or, or deliverables. And that's what these so long-term projects are for. What is what is long-term? How how long are we talking? Well, I think um, anything longer than five years really is um, would be considered like the shortest long-term trial. But if we change, let's say in our crop rotation trial, if we change a crop management oh. practice, so it could be a tillage or crop rotation, um, usually it takes about 10 years or so to, for that system to equilibrate. And so um, it, it'd be nice to have a long-term trial like um, with a 10-year result, um, like a synopsis or a milestone after 10 years. But these 20 or 30-year long-term trials, they're very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And super valuable. That is one of the things yeah. I know there are some of those very long term trials out west as well. Um, there's one here in Ottawa. And, um, you know, realistically, this is invaluable information and to be able to sort of go through that data and glean what you can. Um, so yeah, so fantastic. And so of course, tonight, we are going to tackle sort of late season considerations. There have definitely been for any of you who've follow along on Twitter. Many discussions about uh, some Western bean cutworm. We are starting to see some yield results in some of the edible, be edible bean crops that had root rot and those sorts of things. Um, so we're, we'll talk about that. Maybe some sudden death syndrome in soybeans um, and perhaps some soybean cyst nematode discussions. And then of course we are going to because, well, wheat peat is, is we think here maybe is going to be here. Anyway, um, with Pete here, of course, and, uh, you know, edging into September here, we are we are going to talk about winter wheat establishment um, and seeds per acre and all those sorts of good things. So, uh, Producer Jay, are we are we good to go on wheat, Pete, or is he still having a bit of an issue? We're still having minor technical issues with Pete. So, okay. <laughs> we're going to see what's well, happening then, here. We may be well, peat -less. Well, we might be peatless and that's okay. In the meantime, um, there you go. So Warren, this is one of the questions I did have, uh, did want to talk about and Warren, thanks for throwing that out there. Stock rot. So he's saying anthracnose stock rot, but I am hearing several farmers starting to talk about some, some stock integrity, uh, on the corn side yes. this year. So, so what are you hearing or seeing or figures going on with that? Yeah, there's, um, Every year we have localized areas with some stock issues in corn and especially like that's a critical management concern um, that a corn plant has a stock issue, especially at this time of year. Um, we're like at the first half of September. And so if a corn crop has or is developing some stock issues, we need to deal with it um, as soon as possible or at least make some uh, plans to make sure that you know, that that field is harvested in a very timely matter yeah now so i do want to yeah go ahead yeah well I, I wanted to ask warren maybe if you can elaborate he's saying certain hybrids yeah. so now it's it's my understanding that of course corn hybrids like say soybeans or canola i mean farmers often are changing out hybrids maybe more often than perhaps a wheat variety or something like that um but when you're noticing differences like that i mean how does that factor into the hybrid selection process for next year? Yeah, so that, that's very important. So it's very important to, I think, to establish a, a good relationship with your seed supplier. So the seed industry, the uh, they know their plants inside and out. And so if you're concerned, if you see some, if you have a historical problem with anthracnose in your corn, for instance, you should be asking your seed supplier, you know, I've had... Uh, and issues in the past, how can, what corn hybrids would be suitable for my field? And they could answer those kinds of questions. So diseases like anthracnose, like we don't, we don't monitor those diseases per se in the, uh, a lot of the public performance trials. And, uh, and so that kind of information would come directly from the seed company and, uh, they would, they would be the best people to help you out with some of those specific diseases. Mm hmm Standability, always an issue, always more so an issue with, let's say, a late crop. Um, and uh, certainly we've had years here in Ontario where 
a lot of corn had to stay out the winter. And that was, of course, mm -hmm. a huge consideration of what you leave out or do not is is yep. how strong those stocks are. Um, now, so we do have uh, one question I do. Everyone's going to make fun of me because I was just going to say we're going to go to the first clip. But now I'm going to now I'm going to bring a question up. So Joey, S, uh, so Pioneer Rep was recommending growing a shorter season soybean variety to get winter wheat in the ground earlier in the fall to get better yield returns on winter wheat. Now, this actually plays into exactly that rotation question as well. Right. So systems approach, thinking about your, mm -hmm. your soybean variety or hybrid in order to get that winter wheat in the ground how important is that yeah that i think that's a great question and we've been recommending this a long time uh, to grow a shorter season soybean variety in order to um i guess favor the wheat crop as we know that wheat timely wheat planting is incredibly important so if wheat can be like the yield can be one bushel per acre per day um yield loss beyond um the optimal planting date or period for wheat so that planting date of course is very important for wheat but also the soybean maturity plays a big role in the yield potential in soybeans so we kind of have to balance each other out so to to kind of get around that we've been um promoting the idea in the past couple of years especially of uh, planting the soybeans maybe earlier than we've ever considered before some growers are even considering planting soybeans before corn at least in uh in uh, in southern ontario and that's to get mm -hmm. a jump on the growing season for soybeans soybeans can withstand a lot of cold soil like more than what you think and uh and so if the soybeans get a head start in uh in the growing season that that means they'll mature earlier as well and that favors the winter wheat crop so you kind of get the best of both worlds i think by planting soybeans as early as possible yeah it definitely it, i mean it, it takes a bit more perhaps planning right and and some considerations for sure uh, and of right. course you don't want to give up yield on that soil crop but soy crop but as you said uh, you know we do have some evidence that shows that those soybeans might be able to get in the ground a little sooner mm -hmm. which will give you that open fall and get that winter wheat in and i'm sure if winter we if if wheat pete joins us he's going to bang his fist on the table and tell us just how important that optimal seeding date is yes yeah. so I, um I could, now i can uh, just Paul, hear him I know it's like the it's like the yeah. the ghost of wheat. Um, now Paul Herman's out my neck of the woods. He's out here in eastern Ontario, uh, back talking about the corn crop and the stock integrity. He says July and August lower solar radiation and dry August did not help this year. More potential stock issues. So yeah, yeah. July was wet but very cloudy. Not a lot of sunshine. Mm -hmm. That's right and smoky. Yeah, and smoky. that's right. Yes, that's right. More so, so in the we... west, but here too. Yeah. Yeah, so we kind of predicted this, that the corn might have an issue. We know that the growing season in most areas of uh, the province, at least anyway, there's some areas that were very dry, you know, before before tasseling or silking. But majority of the fields in Ontario, at least, had a very high yield potential. The crop looked excellent, especially in the southwest. And of course, those big ears, um, the plant has to fill a big sink. And so mm -hmm. we were thinking, hmm, maybe the crop might be um, source deficient and um, because of this big sink that it had to fill. And I think it's true. And I think that part of that photosynthate is, um, is being taken up by the ear. And some of that mm -hmm. photosynthate is being robbed from the stock. And the um, stock, it's just, right? yeah, just because the plant can't, can't photosynthesize enough. Mm hmm yeah i see peter i see peter but he has no sound and he looks very frustrated so we're all going to be easy on him when he does eventually join um because he looks very frustrated okay you know what jay uh producer jay we are going to go we are going to switch gears a little bit we are talking corn so let's stick with corn but we'll we'll go to our clip um now this is a clip from 2018 with Tracy Bowdy, uh, the provincial entomologist, talking about Western bean cutworm. And this is another one of the ones that if you've you've been on Twitter and, and following along, uh, certainly, and especially Eastern Ontario seems to be pretty hard hit with tip feeding, not so much uh, through the sides, but Western bean cutworm showing up in spots that maybe we don't anticipate levels being as high. And there's a lot of, I think, agronomists and producers kind of scratching their heads on this one. So this clip 
is actually from, as I said, a couple of years ago, and it, it's sort of looking at 10 years of Western bean cut room, cutworm in the province. And so I'm interested to hear, and I hope we, Pete hops on, but even from your perspective, Dave, and from those in the comments, uh, sort of where we're at on this just these few years later. Um, so, oh, yes, yes, Warren, they are going through the sides too. I know, I'm sorry. You should probably post some of the pictures of the terrible ears of corn that you have found because it is disgusting. Okay, Jay, let's go to the clip and then we'll uh, meet back to chat about it. Um, it's uh, apropos today that we're standing next to a uh, Western bean cutworm trap. Um, I want to talk about the fact that, hey, it's 2018, Western bean showed up in this province 10 years ago. And you know, what we've seen and where we're going. You know, when you look back to 2008, um, you know, what was it like back then, Tracy? You know, where is this, where is this pest gone over that decade? Yeah, so it expanded from the Great uh, Plains region. We saw it, we anticipated it coming this way. They gave us a heads up that, hey, the Great Lakes, the, the way you have humidity and weather, it's ideal for this, this pest. And so we started monitoring using these old school milk jug traps. Um, and caught it in 2008 and ever since it has slowly progressed from being in the hot spot regions, you know, Bothwell, Thamesville, the sandy soils in, uh, in Tilsonburg to becoming the primary pest in, of corn in the Great Lakes region. We've learned a lot, uh, we keep learning. That's, that's what's interesting about this insect. Not only from the trap technology, changing the way we do the trapping, but also how we scout and, and manage it. Let's talk about the impact. I mean, like, you know, typically we talk about, you know, um, 15 bushels, yep. sorry, per acre when you have, you know, one pest on one air. Yep. Uh, is that typically what we're seeing now? We somewhat manage the yield side more so. This, this, when it comes to this pest, especially in the Great Lakes region, it's the quality issue. Um, it, because of the feeding damage it does in the ear, it helps in, induce some of the uh, mycotoxins that are already environmentally um, related, but still the presence of this pest is increasing that. And so we have to try and manage now uh, Michigan, Ontario, Quebec, um, now even it's progressing to the Maritimes, um, this pest specifically for quality issues in the ear. So tell me about, uh, I guess, you know, where we go from here. We've got BT, we've got some good fungicides. What's the strategy going forward? Yeah, um, we're improving on monitoring. Uh, first off, having a trap at your field helps you uh, know it, when it's present, when it peaks, and it is, it peaks differently in each region. So it's great that we have uh, now over 650 traps last year in the Great Lakes region, so we can see it progressing. Then we know when to go out and scout and look for eggs and management. We have changed our thresholds to include an, an accumulative number, 5% of the plants um, over a two or three week scouting period. And then management. Because it's a quality issue, we want you to target it when uh, the fresh silks are there to spray for insecticide and fungicide and, and um, manage the mycotoxin concerns. What about, I guess, you know, from our, again, our management perspective, you talked about resistance management, you know, making sure that we keep the technology that we have because we yes. need them for this pet. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, you know, we know we've learned so much from Ontario and Michigan. We had to change the thresholds. We had to change the management timings, but we also learned here we had resistance to Cry1F. We confirmed that here. We've confirmed it's a primary pest here. And there's not many other technologies coming down the pipeline for this pest. So we really have to focus now on resistance management, both in terms of, of the VIP BT um, or VIP um, Cry that we use, but also the um, insecticides. There's a lot of acres that use one primary um, insecticide, and that is just going to push this insect to resistance. So we really have to focus on rotation. Okay, so we we almost have Wheat Pete back, everyone who is waiting in the wings, um, wanting wanting to hear from him. Uh, but we're working on it. Okay, so of course, the ending of that clip, Dave, probably music to your ears, of course, is that we really have to think about rotation with corn. Now, um, so that was a couple of years ago. And some of what Tracy Bowdy was talking about, of course, has sort of come um, to the forefront here with some of the challenges that we are definitely having with this with this pest. Um, there were questions, though, out of the east here 
uh, Lee Hudson was one of the ones that posted them sort of being somewhat surprised by the feeding damage, somewhat surprised by the pressure because the the traps didn't necessarily have the moth counts they thought and the scouting didn't show them it would be that bad. And her question, which I really loved, was what are we doing wrong? So any insight there in why potentially this pest is is still feeding and causing quite a bit of damage, even when you've sort of done everything right? Well, one, one of the major challenges of with this pest and scouting and managing is just finding those egg masses. Um, so we can't really, we cannot um, judge the pressure of Western bean cutworm in the field by the number of um, moth counts in the trap. And the, moth, the trap counts, moths in the traps, they just uh, indicate a peak flight. And so if you have a peak flight, that means that you should be scouting in your field for threshold levels. But it's just that that field management scouting practice that is just full of, um, uh, I guess, frustration just because it's very easy to miss um, egg masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I, I mean, really, we are seeing certainly a lot of tip feeding. Um, yes, as Warren did point out, yes, they're still coming through the side as well. Um, but really does seem to be, um, even on, on soil types that maybe don't seem particularly or wouldn't typically be um, what you would consider the Western bean cutworm, um, most common areas are mm -hmm. still being hit quite hard. So definitely this is one of those ones that is, is a challenge for sure. Um, lots of comments too and comments right now and tonight about northern corn rootworm um mm -hmm. or corn rootworm problems and so anyone of course now dave you've been on the ontario diagnostic days so i want to point that out as well tracy bowdy did a fantastic um or her and her team have been working on you know scouting for this pest and assessing damage of this pest and and those sorts of things so wh where are we at from your perspective dave anyway with, with rootworm what are some of the biggest challenges with that pest right now well the biggest uh, way to manage the rootworm of course is to um have a good crop rotation so corn after corn or continuous corn, that's a big no-no or a big high-risk uh, situation. But we're most concerned, I think, about um, like corn growers like grow continuous corn for feed, usually. Usually those are livestock producers, yeah. so it's really hard to, to get out of that rotation. There are some management practices that maybe alternatives that one should consider. And uh, Christine O'Reilly has, and Tracy Bowdy have, talked about some of these alternatives I, I think on on previous the agronomist episodes but mm -hmm. um i think like rotation is important but we're most concerned about resistance because uh there aren't many uh bt proteins coming down the pipeline with different like modes of action in order to control um the development or the resistant types of um of corn rootworm and this is we've already we, all, we know that some corn rootworm in Ontario, there's evidence that it's resistant uh, to the current BT proteins that we have in our hybrids. And they've seen this in the US for the past decade. And Ontario is just really catching up um, to that pressure or to those observations in the US. So this is our most concern. Greatest concern is that slowly as those insects are developing resistance, we are losing the ability to control um, corn rootworm in, in, in particular. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, this is often the biggest challenge for exactly that for those who are trying to produce feed. So so silage corn. Um, and and so when you mentioned Christina Riley, who's, of course, the forage specialist, one of the challenges, of course, is trying to find that land base that that you could potentially mm -hmm. grow your corn on and and maybe have to do a bit of a land swap potentially to that's try right. and get that rotation straightened out right because that's one of the yeah. challenges it's finding that land yeah. that's suitable um yeah. but definitely i i get the sense and maybe i'm wrong uh, but i get the sense that this i mean you did say that we are sort of catching up um in the, maybe the wrong kind of way uh but it does feel like it snuck up on us maybe a little quickly yeah it, it that's right and sometimes these things do like Weed specialists have warned about uh, herbicide-resistant weeds for years, 
And then a lot of growers know about them, heard about them, but really they don't pay a lot of, uh, some of them at least anyway, don't pay a lot of attention until it shows up on their farm. And then they have to act on it and and um, and manage those herbicide resistant weeds. And I think the same thing holds true for um, resistant insects as well. And sometimes you don't realize that some populations in the field might be resistant until you see significant damage and then it's too late. And those mm -hmm. insect populations, like they're gonna stay, and, and, and rootworm in particular, they will stay resistant. And so they would have permanent resistance. Those populations would have permanent resistance to some of these uh, BT pro right. proteins in particular. And this is also, I mean, you mentioned herbicide resistance as well, herbicide resistant populations of certain weeds. This is, you know, one of the things I think that as, as farmers and agronomists, of course, that are advising farmers, there isn't always necessarily going to be a super great solution in a bottle, let's say, or in a seed treatment or in a whatever, or something you can spray on coming down the pipeline. I mean, we can't depend on... That's right. You know, the the science side solving this in a in a spray form, regardless of what that is, overnight anyway. Even if even yeah. if we're not talking, you know, chemistry, even if we're talking, well, I know we could talk about nematodes maybe a little bit if you you know, so even if we're talking biological things, realistically we can't be dependent on there being a solution that can just be added. We might yeah. have to take some pretty hard lumps on rotation and, and other things. Yes, that's um, right. So that's why we need to really practice integrated pest management or integrated weed management to to just um, to control or reduce the development of resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, Jason wants to talk about kochia. And I'm not saying that that you need to talk about kochia. I just want to throw this out there, Jason, that I, I, I do think now Jason's in Manitoba and such a challenging growing season was so dry for so long. But then, of course, there some rain did come, and and the kochia is making the absolute most of a very challenging growing season, and it just shows how incredibly resilient that plant is, uh, mm -hmm. not in a good way. So what right. we need to do, Dave, is we need to take why kochia is so successful, and we need to splice that into other crops. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Pretty sure yeah, people that, don't like so it when we do that. That, that sounds like, <laughs> like a really good idea. It almost yeah, sounds like it, a GMO. <laughs> it almost sounds like it. And then, but people, a lot of people yeah. don't like those. A lot of people yeah. love them. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so yes. Okay. So we, I don't know if we're, if we're ever going to get uh, Pete in here, but that that's okay. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. It looks like it may not work. So I think it's, it might just be um you and me here dave and i did i went over to my email so now i'm gonna freeze for a bit and and that's okay i i do have a few things that uh pete did of course want to cover and want to share you can tell me yeah you can tell me things you want to talk about or not and he'll probably uh show up in the comments at some point and to tell us we're right or wrong we'll see but that's okay we got plenty and we still have clips to get to which i don't know maybe we'll go to the last one maybe we won't um how uh, do you want to talk about now uh yes late season pests weeds are always one of them but can we talk about tar spot a little bit um yeah, absolutely as far as that disease in the corn crop this year okay so where are we at um is there so this is this is one of my general curiosities do you do people just randomly send you know, the OMAFRA team and the U of G team and all you, all you extension people just like an email and be like, Hey, I found this. Can you identify it, identify it for me? And that's how yeah. you confirm things. Or is there like an organized approach to this? That, so like media, it's just, there's just so many different realms of media these days, right? There's Twitter, text, email, um, Facebook. And, um, and I encourage my students to use whatever you like, right. To trans, to um to communicate um different issues in the field and so i get lots of images from my students in the past especially say hey dr dave what is this can you identify it and some of them pictures are just the most blurry pictures i've ever <laughs> seen in my life so what is this like it looks like a picture yeah. of a pool of water or something it's just yeah. so blurry and it looks like a pool of water but but yeah, we do get a lot of pictures of um, issues out in the field. And as an agronomist, um, all agronomists, I think, just love to get 
uh, pictures or issues out in the field because it's just like a, a challenge to solve what's going on or to identify this or or to figure this or that out. And and it's all part of the learning process too. I just love it because you know there's a potential that I'll learn something, a good potential, and uh, and help someone out possibly at the same time. So now with Tarspot, I did see an agronomist or two um, sending out some images uh, uh, just maybe two weeks ago, uh, but it was in a county I hadn't heard it was in before. So are, is, is, you know, is, is Albert Tenuta keeping track of all the places this is? And he's got a little map with flags all over it in his office because that's how I envision it. Yeah, he's um he's part. I'm not part of this network. Um, yeah, I don't deal but, with yeah. with exactly to the depth that he does. But he he um I guess we both do have ties or connections in with a crop protection network out of the U.S. and they do have maps and so they can track the spread of certain diseases. And tar spot is one of the ones that we've been tracking for several years now. And the first incidence of tar spot appeared in Ridgetown. We found it in Ridgetown actually last year. One of my technicians found or identified tar spot maybe about maybe 11 months ago. I think it was in the month of August. And <clears throat> But this year, when I go out to every field, I think every field I've seen has at least um, a very low presence of tar spot. So you can find it in just about every field now, which is and which it is it's kind of scary when that happens mm -hmm. when it's so widespread yeah now ty is asking a question here and we have done quite a bit uh ty on tar spot um in the ontario diagnostic days but also within our corn mm -hmm. schools so i highly recommend head over to realagriculture.com um you can use the search bar look do tar spot yeah. in there and you'll find uh Absolutely. quite a few resources there yeah um in how to identify it and control and those sorts of things but as you said dave it's one of these that seems to have come on quite quickly um you know we did have i think you know burn tobin did a video a couple of years ago about you know being on the lookout for this um and then sure enough of course it traveled in through and and away we go so um kind of important. Now I want to, I want to touch on the photo thing one more time because Lara, my coworker is in the comments and she's saying she loves trying to solve things via photo. I do too. I love that. I get, um, neighbors will send me a weed picture and say like, what is this? And it's like, there's apps for this, you know, you don't have to send it to me, but anyway, um, I, I like to try and it's fun to learn, but I will say we've actually done articles on how to take a good agronomy question photo because you're mm -hmm. right sometimes you don't put something in for scale so let's say a pen or a you know or a ruler if you have it great but just put a dollar or, or a toonie or something for scale mm -hmm. um make sure it's focused and then send us send some details so is it in a soybean field is it in a corn field is it in because all of those yeah. things make um trying to identify what you're looking at yeah, um, yeah exactly yeah so so there you go um so yeah so so warren says uh, that he needs to talk with his cornell extension contacts because about a year ago tar spot was uh spotted in syracuse and heading north potentially now i think you mentioned that before warren and i want to say that albert had some information about that so i'll put you in touch with him um and also um lara did say that she linked to the article in the write-up for so for all of you who are watching this either via youtube um head on over to realagriculture.com um and for this post and and she'll have the links in there as well so that's uh that's also how we learn we all just share and that is the joy of the internet we can link to all the past things that we did on this stuff and away we go um on on that note though and because we have a whole show to talk so hey why not um how much now we we are doing ontario diagnostic days virtually in it right we've done it all on video right. burn has gone out to the field and done lots of it do you miss the actual day of the field day that you will go around and do do you miss that in-person yes. field day yeah yes i i do and um uh, it just miss that interaction that one-on-one -on -one, that question answer time um it's always fun to do these demonstrations, but also to answer the questions. And there's lots of back and forth feedback. And so that's always great. And it's still great that we can do it online. It's just um, it's just another way, another tool, I guess, that we can communicate. 
but the ultimate of course is um is in person face to face but one thing yeah. i do not miss is giving the same talk 20 <laughs> times in a day and the 20 <laughs> times again the next day and sometimes i just you know i forget what my name is you know after the 10th time 10th yeah. time um, give, giving the same talk and so that's the thing that i don't miss but everything don't else miss. yes yes i miss yeah and sometimes I think people forget that, that the people that are at the stations, you know, you, they have to give the same presentation that many times that day. And I think, um, and my hat goes off to you because I, I spoke at SWAC a couple of years ago and I, I, we had to speak three times over the course of it. Mm -hmm. And even that, it was like, yeah, what did, did we say this in the last one? Did we say this? In the, right. You like, you have to remember, yep. but I, I too, um, yeah, I too miss the in-person because, and this is sort of part of the inspiration for the agronomists was when, of course, none of us could go anywhere and also in winter, um, was, was putting us together so that we could have this question and answer more similar to what you would have in a field day um, in that this is, I think, the access to extension people and having a topic to discuss. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to do it when we can't necessarily be face to face. Um, but it is always nice to see things in person, uh, to ask yeah. questions of those researchers and all those sorts of things. So, yes, I am also very glad that we can offer it as a video um, for this year, but I, I missed field days too. So, um, <laughs> Warren wants to know, do you actually say the same talk 20 times? Yes. How many times do you, yes. Yeah. Really? It's just, it's that many. Yeah. At, at Ridgetown we do. Um, we have, it has changed a little bit from year to year. It changed like last year, of course, it's changed completely online, yeah. but usually we have yeah. 10 one day and then the same 10 the next day, like a two day event. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, a lot. Challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's too many. Um, you should have like an assistant there and then like just switch off like the auctioneers do. Be like, okay, you've heard it five mm -hmm. times. You must know it by now. <laughs> you can just do this. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, uh, Pete has given up trying to join. We will, we'll figure that out for next week, but he is here in the chat. Um, so we will for sure, um, We'll look at some of these questions and and Pete will follow along as well. I'll read them out as well and we'll get to some of them because I do, I do want to devote a little bit of time to um, wheat establishment. We of course do talk about it um, in the wheat school and on Wheat Pete's Word every week, but it's always great to ask those questions. And I know he's already getting, as you mentioned, Dave, you know, as the the soybean crop comes off, the, the wheat goes in and because things are a little ahead of schedule, we do have some wheat going in pretty early so there's definitely some right. questions um so so we will get to that actually so well if um oh paul wants to know dave will there be any tar spot trials next year at ridgetown yeah actually yes actually there are tar spot trials this year Al oh. albert has some in comparing fungicides okay all right but so i also i also want to rate our um corn hybrids in several occ locations as well i'm not I wouldn't be allowed to publish that data, of course, but I could relay that data back to the seed companies and that would add to their knowledge as well, how their right. hybrids might or might not perform. Right. And actually that reminds me, Leander Campbell uh, earlier in the chat asked, in doing long-term research trials, do you always use the same varieties or hybrids? Because how do you account for genetic gain over time? Which you can tell right, so, he's a research yeah. scientist too. <laughs> So it's one of the questions that we have in these long-term trials is that if per, if the best management practice changes, let, let's say like through scientific evolution, like should we change, let's say a specific treatment or a technique or a management practice in these long-term trials? And the quick answer is this absolutely yes, we have to keep the trials relevant to the best management practice that are practices that are applied on the farm. And so this goes with the hybrids as well and the soybean varieties and the, and the wheat varieties. We want the most popular, highest yielding genetics in these trials as possible to keep them relevant to uh, farm fields. And it's also relevant in trend lines as well. If we, if we select high yielding corn, soybean and wheat varieties, the most popular ones usually are the most high yielding ones. And so we, we integrate or I guess, e the varieties evolve in our trials as well. Okay. I I love that too in that um it's a great question Leander because it's it's a fabulous sort of 
you know, how do we best capture sort of rotational benefits and those sorts of things. But exactly that, we want to do what farmers are doing as well as they evolve. The other thing I often think about is, you know, the average farming career, let's say, is, is 40 or 50 seasons, let's say. And you only have that many seasons to continually improve, but at some point then it's somebody else's 40 or 50 seasons. So um, at some point you do need a line in the sand to say, what have we learned from this five years? Because if we constantly, you know, if we kept everything the same for five years, well, farmers would have moved on to other hybrids or varieties Mm -hmm. by then, right? Mm -hmm. So um, especially with corn, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. super cool. Great question. I love it. Okay, so uh, producer Jay, um, I'm going to skip over the soybean um, video right now, although he does, and we'll run out of time, but he does say at the end, what does he say if you don't test? Oh, crumb. It was a great quote. I'll, I'll look it up while this video is playing, but let's play the Wheat Pete video because Pete is now here in the comments, and I'm sure he cannot wait for everyone to see this video that is 10 years old. No, it's 11 years old. It's from 2010. And the reason I selected this one is because I wanted to know if after 11 years, do do the rules change? And I was very glad to see that when I sent this to Pete, he said, I think I disagree with myself, at least in part. Um, so that's great. So Jay, let's go to the, uh, yes, there you go. Oh yeah, do the test to beat the pest. It's uh, about soybean cyst nematode. Thanks, Pete. Anyway, okay, let's uh, watch this ancient video on uh, winter wheat establishment and then we'll chat. Feeding rate. Uh, a lot of farmers think about uh, uh, pounds per acre, but sometimes that's not the most accurate or the most ideal. What, what, what about seeding rates? Yeah, pounds per acre just drives me absolutely insane, Sean, because it means nothing. Or bushels per acre, two and a half bushels per acre. What the heck is that? If I have 150 pounds of seed and it's 10,000 seeds per pound, that's going to be a whole lot less seed per acre than as if I plant 150 pounds per acre and it's 14,000 seeds per pound. And we get those differences in wheat. In fact, some of the varieties have been as low as 8,000 seeds per pound and some of the other varieties have been up 14,500, almost pushing 15,000. So if all you do is seed seeds, or pardon me, pounds per acre, your seeding rate could vary by as much as 100%. And if you're paying $25 a bag for seed, that means you're either paying far too much because you're overseeding, or you're paying not enough because you're not getting enough seeds out there. So every grower in the province really needs to look at, at seeds per acre or seeds per foot of row. I really like to talk seeds per acre because that's an easy way to calculate back and you calculate backwards so you know that that seeding rate is 135 pounds or 165 pounds or whatever the right rate should be. And seeds per acre, on most soils in the province, we would talk about 1.5 million seeds per acre. On the heavy clays, because we don't get quite as good a growth, not quite as good establishment, it's 1.8 million seeds per acre. Many growers really have trouble with that that whole concept, kind of like, they, like, what is 1.8 million seeds per acre? How do I relate to that? That's really tough. So why are we so stuck? Because this isn't just an Ontario issue. This is an issue across Canada. Why are we so stuck on referring to everything in bushels per acre or pounds per acre in seeding? It's because that was the old way. My dad, when I grew up farming, and I, you know, you'd say, what's the right seeding rate? Dad would say two bushels per acre. No matter the, no matter the moisture conditions, no matter the area, it was that's what he did it was two bushels per acre because in general terms right when when back when wheat only yielded 50 bushels per acre in 1948 my dad was proud as a peacock because he made the 50 bushel per acre club in wheat well lord help us now i want to hit 150 bushels per acre i need to be better than two bushels per acre and two bushels per acre worked not only for wheat it worked for barley it worked for oats it worked for buckwheat i mean everything was kind of in that range and cereal crops are plastic enough that if you don't hit it exactly right well it's not the end of the world so way back in in olden days it was okay nowadays if we want to be in the top end of producers and we want to make the most money possible then we have to be better than that and so you could say well if I plant on time it doesn't matter two bushels two and a half bushels is going to be enough 
it really does matter, Sean, because in Ontario, if you plant on the really early side and you plant too much seed, it gets lots of growth in the fall. You will get snow mold over the winter. And a few years back, we, we got some really good data where we had seeding rate trials planted on the 9th of September. And when we planted 1.8 million seeds or 2 million seeds per acre, we reduced our yield very significantly and in those 20 foot wide strips you could see the snow mold everywhere. We went down to a million seeds per acre and we had no snow mold whatsoever. So there are some ramifications beyond just the cost of the seed and growers need to do those calculations. It's not rocket science, it's really not. It says on the tag how many seeds per pound and you can do that math and work it backward or run your drill and 23 seeds per foot of row is 1.5 million. If you need to get to 1.8 million, it's a 27 or 28 seeds per foot of row. You can run your drill and see that number of seeds per foot of row and actually get yourself where you need to be if you don't like doing the mathematical calculations. What, are, what is the range in Ontario? What is the, the range that we're dealing with here in terms of uh, yeah, seeds so, per foot of row. So seeds per foot of row, uh, the range really can vary pretty dramatically. If in fact I'm on a good loam soil and my normal planting date, let, date let's say is October 1st and I get an early year like this and I have some early planted edible beans that come out of the field on the 5th of September and I think I'm going to go plant my wheat on the 10th of September because gosh early planted wheat really really wins. Well, then I have to pull back all the way to at least 1.2 and maybe even back to a million seeds per acre. So now I'm at about 16 seeds per foot of row. So that's kind of the low end of the scale. The other end of the scale is when I'm on heavy clay and it's the 1st of November and I want to plant wheat. So I'm late, late, late. The soil conditions are far less than perfect. And then I really want to run at least 2 million seeds and maybe even 2.3, 2.4, 2.5 million seeds. So now, instead of 16 seeds per foot of row, I'm ramping up closer to almost 40 seeds per foot of row. So we can get those ends of the spectrum. Realistically, 90% of the time, somewhere between 23 and 28 seeds per foot of row is, is where you want to be. Okay, so Pete is here in the comments, but we are going to go over some of this, of course. Um, I did want to shout out to Joey for the LOL moment of if you miscount or if you lose count, do you go back and start again? Which, no. Can you please not do that? Um, okay, so we are talking, I, I think, again, that is an old video. And so I love that there's some things to update because I should hope in 10 years we improve of some things. Um, but one of the one of the big things, of course, is if you're going on the very early side. So as Pete mentioned that video after edible beans, let's say, or he actually did send a picture um, on planting wheat into silage stubble, which I know is maybe not ideal. Um, but it does certainly bring up how early you could do it. And when you do, I think we've got a picture here, when you do, how you have to adjust that seeding rate. And, and so Pete, if you do want to weigh in on the comments, I will gladly read them out. But one of the things that he did talk about on We Pete's Word this past week was, I know in the video he mentioned snow mold, but of course this year, and Dave, maybe you can weigh in on this as well, lodging was a pretty big issue. And one of the issues, of course, is when you're planting wheat on the early side, it has that much more time to tiller and that much more time to make those heads that can potentially then fall on over. So Dave, Dave, what was the experience down in your neck of the woods with lodging this year? Because it seemed to be pretty widespread. Yes, absolutely widespread. Lodging was a major issue in the wheat crop. And um, really it surprised us all. And I think it surprised Peter and it surprised me. We both talked about you know, the lodging potential. We have some plant growth regulator projects, some very high. Uh, we try to uh, have conditions or make an experiment to have um, it be like a high risk lodging experiment. And at Ridgetown, we did not have um, very much lodging there, but at our other sites, we did have significant lodging. And even in my own field, I had quite a bit of um, the wheat uh, lodged. And so I made some mistakes in that field. It lodged because I mismanaged um, part of growing my wheat crop, my own wheat crop. And uh, I just need to improve on my management uh, next year. Some of the things though are weather dependent and it's hard mm -hmm. to predict the weather, of course. And um, 
And so I'm kind of kicking myself, I guess, extra hard when things don't go as planned, but it's, it's all a learning experience for sure. It is. And, but I think you were in good company this year, Dave, because there was uh, I think there were many farmers who were a little taken aback by the lodging yeah. that did occur and at, and in such a large area for sure. Um, so Peter saying that picture of planting into corn stubble, of course, not ideal because fusarium is going to be a risk. Um, of course, fusarium, uh, we're used to talking about with wheat, but of course in corn, it's gibberella, but it is the same pathogen. And so he's saying, obviously, if you're going to do that, that fusarium is the risk. So manage for that risk, but that Sorry. planting early, planting early, uh, trumps the fusarium risk for there. So there you go. Um, I'm not sure why Chris has said, is asking about lodged soybeans, but Chris is also not supposed to be on our internet and he is at my house. And so if my picture screws up, it's his fault. Um, okay. Also, yes. So Peter is saying, yes, lower the seeding rate to improve standability and seeding rate by seeding date interactions are super, super key. Yes, um, so, and, and, and same side of, so early we dial it back, but you know, if you're going in the, let's say 45th of October or something like that, um, obviously we're bumping those rates simply because realistically there's just that, that much more pressure on those teeny little seeds to have to grow through um, less than ideal conditions. Um, yeah, that's right. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. At, yeah the later exactly. that we plant, the less time there is for those plants to tiller. And potentially those tillers would form ahead. And if so, if those, if those tillers um, can't form because there's not enough growing season left, that's why we have to increase the seeding rate. Okay. And, and he says, Dave, you have to talk about the hundred growing degree days and more heads per plant. What is the hundred growing degree rule here? Hmm, I have no idea. Oh, wait, I know what it is. <laughs> It I'm takes a hundred. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Yeah, he's referring to um, the the relationship of tillering versus uh, growing degree days, and it takes one hundred growing degree days to form one tiller in the fall, and so that's why when you have early planting, you have more of those growing degree days, more tillers can form. There's for you should have a lower seeding rate when you're planting ultra early, let's say after a silage or or something like that. And that's something that I need to look at more carefully for lodging management, because we need to focus a little bit more, I think, on seeding rate in wheat in order to manage, um, intensively manage wheat. And because nitrogen is so important for, for wheat, of course, high yielding wheat and plant growth regulators fit in with that as well. And variety of genetics uh, fit with that. And we need to pay attention to seeding rate as well because it can also influence uh, how much wheat is going to lodge or the lodging risk and it plays a huge role in soybeans especially and so I, I know this is off topic and someone mentioned soybeans in the chat and i think a lot of growers still plant soybeans at a little bit too high plant population everyone likes to see a thick soybean stand and uh, a nice quick green field and uh, you can achieve that with high seeding rates but it also introduces other problems as well. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, I well, I think you're right, right? We wanna see lots of growth. We wanna see, you know, that it canopy and all those sorts of things, but definitely this year and, and we'll see how it, it goes when we take it to yield. But I saw some soybean yep. fields that were, I mean, beautiful as far as lush and green and thick, but I, I have to wonder if you walked those, how bad the white mold would be in some of those right. because oh yep. my goodness there was some um yeah some pretty tough it, i think yep. there's gonna be some pretty tough that's conditions right. for sure yep. yeah so and see, and uh it's expensive too well and that's the other thing there's also the economics of it yep. right if it's not actually right. going to add yield then then realistically it's just a cost um okay yep. so jason has a question here and so this works into our later season in a drought so in dry conditions or a drought how important is it to control late season volunteers and weeds um, after some rain going into winter. So Manitoba does, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but but Jason, I would say Manitoba does quite a bit of post-harvest weed control. Um, but he's asking if there's research to support it. So how important is it to control late season volunteers and weeds heading into winter? 
Well, I'm a, a big proponent of cover crops. And so uh, like volunteers could be, volunteer wheat, for instance, could be uh, a nice cover a ni as a cover crop. Uh, but also in a dry season area, um, you have to be um, aware that some of those those plants or that canopy could be drawing moisture um, deep from subsoil or reserves um, deep down. And so that could uh, affect uh, future crops as well. And but I think for for weeds, no question, we need to control weeds after harvest because that just contributes to the weed seed bank amongst other issues. And so um, I think weed control um, takes um, utmost precedence especially for weed seed return. And we talked about herbicide resistance and if plant plants go into, um, it produce plants producing seed, weeds produce seed. That's how resistance is developed, right? If a plant mm -hmm. doesn't produce any seed, um, it resistance won't happen. So mm -hmm. we and need so, just to control weeds. Yeah. And, and Pete was saying here too, absolutely. If, if those are weeds that are going to go to seed, that's the that's the point where you need to do yep. something about yeah, it if, if they're yep. right so as you said you know wheat regrowth isn't i mean that's more of a cover that's not really a weed that's not going to you know contribute to yep. the seed bank or anything like that so right. um so it definitely does depend on what uh you're dealing with my suspicion is for many areas that did get that late rain on the prairies you're going to be dealing with weeds not necessarily just regrowth um simply because those seeds like to germinate when they can and they got that uh they got mm. that moisture so there you go um okay so mr tate had i think we mentioned it briefly but let's just touch on this um talking about of course so you had your own challenges with that lodging the wheat lodging this year so talking about the importance of a growth regulator um in management of wheat and so i i it's my suspicion this year there was there were differences but it didn't necessarily eliminate lodging no, that's right. It can reduce the risk, but it doesn't eliminate uh, lodging mm -hmm. for sure. So sometimes the lodging potential could be so great that it would just overwhelm the plant growth regulator. It might improve or reduce lodging a little bit, um, but sometimes the wheat is just so susceptible to lodging, uh, a plant growth regulator um, doesn't always um, solve the problem. So mm -hmm. it, again, it requires an integrated approach. Mm -hmm. lodging management okay does. and yeah now we didn't run <laughs> of course so we didn't run the soybean video the soybean clip i wanted to run um but uh, it did talk about of course sudden death syndrome and also soybean cyst nematode and so why it's really important to test your soil at the end of the season uh, to get those right. counts of the soybean cyst nematode because of course um they've had whatever is there it gives you a good indication um but it Tate and uh, Mr. Tate has a question here about spider mites. So um, I know that there were aphid, there was aphid pressure earlier in the year on soybeans. Um, late season spider mites, do we really need to worry about economic damage from them or is it just gross? Because I think they're gross. Well, spider mites can destroy a soybean crop, especially if they um, infest the soybeans early in development or, or early in development, I'm saying in the R stages. Uh, so in the early R mm -hmm. stages. And so if there are spider mites at say R6, uh, we know that of course um, it won't affect the soybean yield uh, that much, but it's very, it's, it's extremely important to be aware of spider mite issues, especially in the early R stages. Yeah, okay. Um, yes. And so, and Peter says, as a caution, of course, also watch your pre-harvest interval. Um, you can't yeah, spray or six or later. And, and that is of course, yeah. one of those things that, um, everyone has to keep in mind, especially this year. It, it did seem to be sort of interesting that it was just such an insect year and shaped up to be that we did see some insect pressure later in the year, but that is definitely one of the things we have to think about is, um, uh, we also had, of course, reports of armyworm uh, in the southwest had come through, and and we're certainly taking uh, taking a bite out of some some oak crop and some uh, some of the forage crops down there. So again, though, you do have to keep that pre harvest interval in mind if you are going to go in with any sort of control. Um, yes, okay, and Peter is answering some questions about uh, wheat streak mosaic virus. So I'm not going to even try and tackle those ones uh because he's got those ones we could do another whole show on just fun names of different 
ones like wheat streak mosaic virus and barley yellow dwarf virus that one's always one of my favorites as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. um viruses get all the great names okay so but we are running out of time here and um yeah. <laughs> so jay was just messaging me and saying hey have you checked the time so i think that's i think that's my cue that we could we could probably keep talking but we don't need to um anyway so i i will say um thank you there was tons of comments tonight i really appreciate it love the conversations that happen in the chat and great to have such uh such comments uh, and dr dave of course um thanks so much for for carrying the show Pete will have to send you a beverage or so. Um, I did want to mention for anyone uh, following along, um, your Twitter handle, at CropDoc2, correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, super important. Make sure you get that two in there so that you're you're following uh, Dr. Dave Hooker here. Okay, so Dave, thanks so much. This has been a ton of fun. Um, yeah. And to everyone I else who joined it. us, thanks so much. Okay, great. All right. Awesome. Cheers, awesome. everybody. See ya. Bye.